You're listening to eLearn Chat, where talk is knowledge. <clears throat> Hello and welcome to eLearn Chat, our new podcast featuring prominent leaders, shakers, and movers in the e-learning and training industry. Your co-hosts are Rick Zanotti and Terrence Wing. And hello, hello everyone. everyone, my, my name, name is Rick Zanotti, Zanotti and, and welcome, welcome to eLearn Chat, Chat, episode number 20. That's, That's a lot of episodes. Anyway, anyway today, today we are joined by the inimical, our co-host. <laughs> Terrence Wing. Hey Terrence, how's it going? Hey Rick, I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm doing great. Thanks for the theme music. Oh, it gets welcome. my day started. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna program my alarm clock for that theme music. <laughs> <laughs> At least on Tuesday, so I know I have to get up to to prepare for Gina's show and to uh, to get on this show. Sounds good. And today we've got a special guest. We do. We've got uh, Kevin Thorne. Most of us know him as Learn Nuggets on Twitter, and he is an avid. Uh, e-learning designer. If you've ever seen his work, and we'll, we'll make sure to put up his website. If you've ever seen his work, uh, you'll you'll be um, astounded at the lengths he goes to make his content beautiful as well as um, intriguing and impactful using learning principles. So, uh, um, I'm a little bitter at Kevin, and Kevin knows why because <laughs> last year. He beat me out of the Articulate Guru Award. So this year it's on, Kevin. It is so on. It's You're on. not going to beat me again this year. Bring it. <laughs> uh, I've, I've already started, just so you know. Have you started yours? Oh, okay. All right. Well, hey, we, we like I said, bring it on. Those of you not yeah, going to, uh, bring to uh, DevLearn, you're going to miss out on a, a heck of a competition. It's fun. It's Tell us a little times. bit about yourself. Ah, uh, yeah, just the nugget head, as you can see by the shine on the top of my head. Um, been in e-learning about nine years, I guess. Retired Army, didn't have anything else. I was really good at living in the woods for a couple of weeks, but that wasn't really a marketable skill. So I thought I'd um, better learn something useful. And um, some of you may know that I, I draw cartoons and I've been animating and doing a lot of cartoon and comic work most of my life. And when uh, Flash came out, um, I just got really excited about animating my own cartoons. So that's where it really all started. And then, uh, just like a lot of folks, uh, by circumstance, uh, back then, e-learning really was just CBT or web-based training, and um, there really wasn't any defined career or defined skill path. So uh, a lot of the pioneers I really look up to as role models for just sort of spearheading this career in this industry as it is today, as we all know it. Mm -hmm. um, and then by circumstance, I just sort of fell into a training department and right at the, uh, I guess, at the core level of, of trying to get to um, online training and e-learning and LMS and all that. So uh, did a lot of in the trench work and a lot of homework and a lot of reading, and a lot of studying at night and just sort of that's what I do. So what do you like best about e-learning, Kevin? What I, what the, the, the creativity, I think the best I like about it is you have absolutely zero limitations when you start a project. That's true. That's the best thing I like about it. What do you, what do you like the least about it? Um, do I dare say sneeze? <laughs> 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 no, I mean, you know, bless their heart. You know, the one thing, the one thing about a SME is they forget to know what it's like not to remember what it's like not to know as, an, as a new learner. <laughs> And that's the hard part, trying to, you know, they're great at what they know, um, and it's it's kind of dialing them down a little bit, say, you know, remember what it's like when you were, like, not knowing anything. And that's the hard part. That sounds um, almost like a little bit of a Rumsfeld imitation there. I only know what I don't know <laughs> that I know that I don't know what I don't right. know what I know. <laughs> I know. I'm trying to tweet that, but I don't know if I can. It's one of those things that you can only say it once. Terrence, uh, Terrence, no, there's not. Terrence, I don't know. To be honest, there's really nothing I don't like about it. There's frustrating. I mean, everybody gets frustrated with the technology sure. and, um, you know, the end delivery environment, trying to figure out where to, you know, uh, you know, whether your LMS will support a video, audio. Um, we've got this varying degree of authoring environments and um, different teams are using different tools and then trying to stitch all that together to get one one course or one project out. Sometimes that gets pretty frustrating. Uh, but that's all part of learning. That's all part of figuring out what works and what doesn't work in your environment. You know, it doesn't. What what works in in our environment may not work 
across the street. It just, I mean, you, and one of the things, um, you sort of have to build for that. You have to plan for that in your project development. Uh, anybody can build an e-learning course that, that has any halfway idea of what instructional design is about. And I don't think that's the problem. Um, not that it is a problem. I just say some of the challenges are I can build you an e-learning program and it'll work fine in my environment. And if I send it to you, it may not work in your environment just because of the different technologies. That's because we have interoperability. Right. Yeah, we'll get there. Imagine if we didn't have interoperability. Well, and um, I'm kind of excited for Aaron Silvers and Project Tin Can and what they're doing over there. They've got some pretty exciting things that they're, they've got planned for us in the future. So sit tight, be patient, because I think some good things are coming. That sounds good. Definitely. Terrence, uh, how's the chat room looking? Uh, we got our regulars in there. We've got uh, David Kelly. We've got Zara. Um, hey, Dave. Jeff. Hey, Zara. Yeah, Jeff is even still awake, so that's uh, it's great, Jeff. Uh, I think it's going on, what, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning over there? We need so to I, send Jeff a gift. He's not on Pacific time, right? He's in Australia. <laughs> hey, <Jeff. laughs> he's in Melbourne. Uh, There's Don. 3 a.m., he says. Yeah, Don's here. So we got a lot of, lot, of, uh, a lot of the usual folks, and the numbers are trending pretty high as far as viewers go, so let's awesome. keep it up. Yeah, and uh, on Pound eLearn Chat is a hashtag for those of you wanting to to tweet as well. So we'd always recommend tweeting. So thank you so much. So Kevin, um, yes, I was reading your most, I guess it was your most recent blog post or one of your most recent blog posts, and you were talking about it, finding inspiration because somebody can come up to you with the world's most boring e-learning project. Um, where do you where do you start that creative cycle to find, you know, find the right inspiration that matches that godforsaken topic? Great question. And I will say that I don't ever start. I'm constantly looking for inspiration, whether I'm on a project or not. Mm. Um, and the reason I've, I, I try to, um, have you ever gotten to this point? Let me, let me tell a little story here. Let's say you're, you're out somewhere and something dawns on you and you're like, wow, that's a great idea. I could have used that for, and then something you've already done in the past. Mm -hmm. um, or you see an idea and you say, wow, that's a really great eye. That would really work great for something you haven't even created yet or something that's not even come on your deck yet. But then when something does come up, you're like, what happened to that idea? Where was it? I remember it. So what I encourage everybody to do is constantly be on the lookout for ideas, inspiration, anything. Um, and then that recent blog post um, was a couple of I iTunes or iPad, iPhone apps. And just the way those were designed, um, that really just, that's the inspiration. It's like, okay, that looks inspirational. So what I do is I'll, I'll take um, an idea like that and I'll quickly draw up uh, in either a wireframe or a quick template or a quick, um, just a quick uh, digital sketch. If I don't have anything with me, I break out the moleskin and I'll, I'll sketch out a real idea. And then when I get back, I'll, I'll put it into some kind of either I'll draw it out in Illustrator as a wireframe or a PowerPoint or OmniDraft, depending on whatever tool I have at my disposal at the time. Give it a couple tags, you know, this is good for this, this or whatever, e-learning template or whatever. And then I just file it away. And then when I have a project that I don't have anything readily available, I go to that sort of library and um, dig through it. So I encourage everybody just to be just constantly be on the lookout. I mean, it's everywhere. Uh, design is everywhere. If you look at marketing, um, marketing is a big thing. TV commercials, um, even though they're, they're video, if you look at some of the ways they're presented, in a lot of ways, TV commercials, you could easily convert to, a, to an e-learning template or, or program. So always look. It's always there. It's all over. Hey, Kevin, you're, yeah, you're, you're a very, very good, good artist. artist. Did you, were, were you formally thank you. trained or did you teach yourself? I really don't know how to answer that, Rick. Um, um, I, uh, Dr. Seuss or Theodore or Thaddeus is my favorite, and because, mostly probably because um, when, when he was at Oxford, he got sort of, he, you know, he quit or dropped out of Oxford, but he got in trouble for drawing his uh, famous uh, uh, Dr. Seuss characters on his uh, Latin, I believe it was Latin, when he was in the lecture. Um, and they have um, they have actual archives of him drawing doodles around his lecture notes. Um, and I remember uh, my first first big memory of getting in trouble for actually getting in trouble for drawing was I was I had a homework assignment I was supposed to do, and instead I got bored, flipped it over, and I started drawing, turned it in, 
as is with the drawings on the back and the homework not finished. I <laughs> uh, got in some pretty big trouble. Then my, my father made me write 500 times, I will finish my homework. So I got bored with writing, I will finish my homework. So I drew in block letters, I will finish my homework. 500 times <laughs> I like it you just, you, you so I just I just took the opportunity to the practice punishment. drawing block letters really <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah I've, I don't really I'm not formally trained as an artist um, I just I've been drawing as long as I can hold a pencil and I never go anywhere without my moleskin so I'm always drawing something now when you were in the army were you doing a lot of drawing as well any any chance to to work in that yeah, I mean, I mean, moleskins are awesome. They're durable and they're pretty, uh, pretty heavy duty. And I just got the heavyweight paper, the little smaller ones. I don't, I don't know that I have one laying here, but um, and yeah, I just put it in my cargo pocket. And it, would, it would go with me wherever I went, whether I was in the field or out in the woods, and I would uh, draw whenever I could. And it makes a great uh, treatment for blisters too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I still get sort of in trouble and scolded. I, I even in meetings in, in corporate. Um, I tend to focus better. Right like, in, I, I draw in church and on Sunday mornings. I'll draw in meetings at work, and I just, I, I don't know. I can focus better when I'm drawing. I can, I can hear better when I'm focusing. That might sound kind of weird to some folks, but that's my story, you know, and I'm sticking to it. And I can, I can attest to you doing that because I remember having dinner with you. Um, I guess what was it last month? We we had dinner together, and you were. Um, while people were talking, you're you're having a conversation, but at the same time, you're you're sketching oh, on a napkin. Yeah, I remember um, that. Yeah. Uh, I think <laughs> I think you were doing Kareen Oberst's avatar. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. yeah. I think we out. were designing her new avatar at that at that dinner. Yeah, yeah. that's right. <laughs> See, yes, I don't I even remember, remember half the time when I'm doing stuff. It just happens. So, so Kevin, one of the topics today is engaging e-learning. Yes, it is. What do you consider engaging e-learning? Um, probably the simplest thing is just to put a monkey in it. I mean, a friend of mine told me any human will be engaged if you put a monkey in your e-learning. It's proven. You just put a monkey in there. Actually, I'm kind of kidding. Um, Brandon, a friend of mine, Brandon, told me that. And uh, I, I have to get a kick out of it because it is true. Scientific fact is you put a monkey. We're all engaged. When we see a monkey, we're engaged. Um, <laughs> who's not engaged? When they, well, there's, there's a couple people I know that don't like monkeys. But um, engaging, you know, I have some notes. Hang on just a minute. Um, puppies and babies work too yeah puppies and babies that's true um, it's it's really difficult because we get into the, the, the psychiatry of things and I don't, I don't want to get into oh, a deep level of thinking um, but in my view there's there's two things that we have to do in terms of engaging one is the instructional design or the instructional flow of the content and then you have the visual design and um, being a visual guy, I will argue that if you don't grab their attention visually within the first two to three seconds, you may have lost them already. Um, we're adults. We don't pay attention very long, and we have a lot of things going on in our world that are distracting, whether it be physical distractions at our desk where we're taking e-learning, or whether it's the storms coming in this afternoon that I roll the windows up, that I you know, um, did I pick up the laundry like I was supposed to? Different. There's a there's a countless number of things going through our minds on a daily basis. Um, so if we want our learners to be engaged in the learning that we're building, then we have to hold their attention. Um, then it gets into flow and the instructional flow. And there's a lot of work, and I can't pronounce his name. Um, well, let me see. I think I wrote it down. Zis Ziskentmel Ahali. Mahali uh, talks about flow and motivation. Um, you can Google that guy. Um, but it's really about how we, as adults, hold their attention initially and then, and then give them um, that sense of uh, accomplishment or that sense of attention while they're there. And then uh, you have to time it to where you got to figure out, and this gets into that psychology stuff, um, when we start losing them, about two to three minutes, they start going downhill. We're going to start losing folks' attention. And then we have to bring them back up. We have to engage them again. Uh, they could be visually. They could be instructionally. Um, so it's really, it's really a challenge on the front end when you're doing it on a team where you've got somebody doing the graphics and you've got somebody else doing instructional design uh, and try to blend that together. Um, if you're, and I'm not going to say fortunate to be a one-person shop, but if you happen to be responsible for both the instruction and the graphics, um, then you, you have a better opportunity, I think, to kind of visually tie in what you're thinking when it comes to instruction. 
That's a mouthful. That makes sense. That makes sense. It does definitely. So you had initially said that you started out with like your, your inspiration is kind of free flowing. That it's mm-hmm. not necessarily that it's the, the beginning of the project. That all of a sudden you look for the inspiration, but you find it everything. I'd agree one hundred percent with you. My my phone is filled with pictures of billboards. Um, I even record certain parts of certain commercials. So I think it's, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm right there with you. But, you know, how do you decide that this is going to be right for for this particular project? You've got this library of inspiration in your head or in a book or in your moleskin or wherever. At, At what point does it speak to you that, you know, this one in particular is the right one? Well, that's that's tough. Again, I don't really, I really don't go that way. That's not really how it works. Okay. I don't, I've never been asked that question before. So let me let me think through that a minute. Um, really, it's just about the content first, and then you start thinking of how can you make the content fun, or how can you make um, I want to say make a game out of it. But if you think, if you think gaming and you think how game designers and game develop game developers engage us, right? Um, let's use Angry Birds for instance. Everybody knows Angry mm-hmm. Birds and Angry Birds, and it's it's huge popularity. What is it about that game that attracts us, and what is it about that game that keeps us engaged? Um, now we can go through all the science of, of what that is, but there's there's some basic fundamental things. One, it's clean, fresh, um, interesting graphics. It's not busy. It doesn't. Um, this, there's no distracting going on. Um, there's levels, so there's there's areas that I get through a certain level and I achieve it, and then um the progress, like the little stars and Angry Birds, you know, you got one, two, or three stars. Even though you, uh, mm-hmm. if you think of e-learning in terms of objective level completions, Angry Birds is sort of like that. You've completed the objective and you got one star, but it may not have been the best you could have done. So there's still a chance where you can go back and do and get two stars or three stars, but you can still move forward to the next objective or the next level. So if you think of e-learning in a lot of, if you kind of use, I'm not saying make all your e-learning games, that's not what I'm saying, but if you use some of the fundamentals of game mechanics, then uh, I, you, you really open up the creativity side of it. Um, and then once you start, you grab the content, um, let, let me give you an example. Um, mm-hmm. um, I believe one of the first things I was ever, uh, was ever told, matter of fact, first time I met Clark Quinn was six, five, six, seven years ago at uh, ASTD in Vegas, and I was sitting through one of his pre-conference workshops um, about his book, and he had mentioned that he can make a game out of any topic, and I was like, yeah, right, nobody can do that. Um, But he went on to describe how this project that he had that involved um, auditing and and discovering errors and auditing records, and uh, really, if you think about it, it's kind of a boring topic to build e-learning around, let alone build a game around. And as he began to interview the learners um, and come to find out they really enjoyed their work and they thought of it as sort of a, a scavenger hunt to go and dig through all these records looking for clues to identify where the problem was in order to solve it. So his idea from that point, he he went off into sort of a detective story. And in my mind, I can't, rem- I can't recall if he actually said this or not, but sort of a Dick Tracy sort of style. Mm-hmm. So you have, first off, you have this content, you have this uh, topic. And you have identified that you're going to create uh, sort of this treasure hunt or scavenger hunt, digging through records to identify clues in order to solve a problem in auditing. So that leads to, okay, now we have some kind of a detective story or treasure hunt. Now you can go a thousand different ways with that. You can go with the Treasure Island theme. You can go with the Dick Tracy theme. There's a thousand different ways you go. So, yeah. and, and, and again, the, the whole question has got my brain kind of, kind of wired right now because you look at content first you look at your subject, and then you grab some friends and do some creative brainstorming and say, how can we make this fun? Mm-hmm. Then you go back and you start picking out themes. Is it a Treasure Island theme? Is it a Dick Tracy theme? Is it a you know, a road trip theme where you're traveling the country and you're collecting stamps to slap on the side of your guitar case or something? I don't know. Something now, like that. Now, one thing in e-learning, a lot of people say, you know, e-learning is expensive, and the more engaging you make it, the more expensive it gets because it takes longer. How, how do you work around the budget issues with with e-learning? I, you know, and that's that's another thing. It's it's um, shiny objects or the clicky clicky bling bling. That one's for you, Cami. Um, <laughs> that's not necessarily engaging. Um, yeah. Uh, let me let me give you an example. There's the the flip book. Um, interaction, I guess you'd call it, 
where you click on the corner and the page sort of rolls and folds over um, and it kind of looks like your page turning. In fact, you're engaging, but that's more of an interaction than it is true engagement because really it's just a shiny next button if you think about it. Yeah, and after you've done that for about four or five times. It's, right, it wears off. The shininess wears mm -hmm. off, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's good for one thing, but do you want to use it consistently? So the engaging thing is more about is it relevant to the learner? What are they getting out of it? And I had made another note. Um, hang on a minute. Nah, I can't find it. Um, but but the the important thing is it rel is it relevant to the, to the end learner? And uh, I think a lot what we I don't say we fail to do, but I think we we sort of get so caught up in the deadlines and um, you know speed to market and different things with our projects um, that a lot of times we forget the end learner and what is it they really want and getting them involved in their environment. So if we if we pull them in and we ask them, you know, how much of this do you need or how much of you don't need, we may end up only needing a five minute module compared to what the project and the SMEs and everybody had got around it or was initially planned for maybe a 20 or 30 minute seat time, when in fact it will solve the problem or address the issue in about five minutes. So the engaging thing goes back to, it's not just one interaction, it's not just one shiny object, it's it's the whole collective thing is, is it engaging from the time I turn on the e-learning, do you, do you get my attention? And can you hold my attention? And if it's, if it's longer than about three minutes or four minutes, what are you going to do to keep me engaged in about two to three minutes? Right. Because the problem with too much engagement, or like I said, clicky, clicky, bling, bling, is you got to keep it up. Right. And that's hard to do. It's hard to do. When you're forcing it. I mean, if you're, if you're trying to force it, oh, we need an interaction here because, or we need an animation here. And the big question, you know, always, why? I mean, wh why are we just putting this here if there's no value to the end learner? Um, so let's go back to the beginning. And let's look at the overall objective, the overall rel relevance to the learner. What's the what's the performance outcome? And we all know this as instructional designers. We, we, we've hashed this over time and time again. And, that, and the hard thing, and I think we're still trying to, um, I guess, define that skill set right in the middle after we've instructionally designed and we've done all the really good hard work on the front end, then where do we get the design ideas and the visuals and the graphics and how do we blend that into a really engaging experience to where we satisfy all of those goals from I the think, front end? I think we engaged Terrence so much we lost him. Let me see if I can get him right back. He, we lost this connection. That's Pacific time messing with him probably. <laughs> Did we lose him? Yeah, we lost him. I'm trying to get him back. He goes on vacation every so often on the show. <laughs> yeah, so far his Twitter is not responding, so let's see if we can well. get him back. Yeah, while you were talking, all of a sudden I switched to a different view and I went, hmm, his screen is completely gone. Let me try him again. The person whom you're trying to reach is currently unavailable. Please leave a message. <laughs> the one the that got away. <laughs> All right, let's try that again. Hey, everybody. Anybody? Uh, this is Jombo, uh, GI Jombo. Um, some of you may know that guy. And like I said, everything is engaging with a monkey. You know, monkeys help. That that you know, it, if you if your e-learning gets boring, just throw a monkey in there. My uh, grandmother gave me that back in the mid '60s. She actually made that. That's my little. That's when I, him and I go round and round every once in a while, between him and Nugget Head. <laughs> All right, let's try him again. Rick, if you don't mind, I'm going to answer a question in the chat room. Oh, Zero. sure. Zero. No, that's great. Uh, I said, asked, um, do you find that orgs are open to theme ideas, and how do you get them to open up to it? Was our um, theme ideas are one-offs, really, in, in corporate organizations, mostly because organizations are template-driven. The person um, whom you're trying to reach is currently unavailable. Please leave a message. Off template... Um, <clears throat> 
not template in the negative sense, but templates in terms of uh, each department has to have the, their own same look and feel. Um, they want consistency across all courses, depending on, on the employee base. Uh, for instance, if you're building for an accounting department, maybe uh, an entire library all look and feel for that department, whereas somebody you're building for, um, you know, the HR side with self, soft skills. So I, I, I've we've done some one-off themes, but it's usually one-off projects that don't fit in the normal um, library of consistent content. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Yeah, one, one thing about uh, themes too is a lot of individual e-learning courses are going to have themes. For example, I've been working with Terrence on a couple projects and we've had um, one theme where we used portals or basically iPads or something similar, any kind of tablet to make believe that we're out in the field and, and communicating with a conference room going on somewhere else. We're doing a sci-fi theme for uh, a county piece we're doing for Los Angeles County. Uh, that's a pandemic piece. That should be actually right. a lot of fun. And so this, you, can, you can give things a theme which makes it all of a sudden a little bit more engaging and more interesting just with the writing. And of course the graphics play into that. Like we're getting to go into all these really cool military-like um, vehicles and so we'll be taking a lot of pictures of those and simulating some of the stuff that goes on but but it's all based on a theme you know there's there's a there's a disaster how do you deal with it how, how do right. you get around it that, that's that's kind of fun and by the way i'm just waiting for terrence to call back i can't seem to get a hold of him i i suspect his internet may have gone down um well i'm gonna grab this other question here by justin um uh, if you don't mind terrence yeah, go ahead. <laughs> i'm gonna take his job <laughs> Uh, let's see. Do you think we can reimagine engagement to include a shared experience with peers around content? So users plus peers plus content. Uh, a meta con Oh, certainly. Um, with the and, and the challenges with um, a lot of orgs, a lot of corporate today is is the likes of um, social media. But what I think what your question is is asking is what social media today and even in the future what some of the some of the things that I know of that are being planned in terms of social media, social interaction, uh, where you can um, sort of engage everybody at one time um, and build on that. Um, I, I think that's where you're going with that question. I'm, I'm not sure if I answered it right, but yeah, um, I think social media is the answer right there. Not in the terms of Twitter and Facebook like we know it and love it today, um, but social in the in the way where you can, and I'm trying to think of a, of a quick idea. Uh, you may have a better idea. You asked the question, you're probably thinking of something already. So. And by the way, for all of those of you who are watching, this is a live show and live things happen sometimes. Yeah, we're live. And yeah. Uh, Terrence is yeah, exactly, Justin, that's it, yeah. Yeah, Terrence isn't too far from the uh, LA airport, so every so often I think they do construction around there. It could probably knock out a line. He hasn't, he hasn't dialed back in yet, or he may have a power outage. Not sure what's going on. Um, is he – I don't have Twitter up running here. Do you have Twitter running over on your end? Uh, I don't. If I can get we it up can look. Can anybody check the eLearn chat and see if he's out there? Let me, I can get in real quickly too. Um, no, I don't see him up there. No new tweets. Uh, Ten minutes ago. Well, uh, I'll tell you what. We'll just keep going. Folks in the chat window there, ask a question. Let's see if we can't keep this going. Don, Dave, Zara, anybody else? Lisa, I see you in there. Do you have any tips and tricks on measuring engagement? <laughs> Do a usability study and get a camera and then face and make sure they don't know the cameras in the room and then let them take your e-learning and you can tell immediately whether or not they're engaged by their facial expressions and their body language. Yeah, that's true. You know, it's uh, interesting. We, uh, some of our pieces that we've done in the past, we had um, a, 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 an interaction lab, if you will, uh, put somebody in, take the training. They were filming their eye movements. They were recording blood pressure, you, know, you name it. They yeah, were heat mapping, everything. right? Yeah, and uh, they found that, that the training was good. So from that point of view, I guess it was a, a good thing. But it was interesting seeing the results. And they, in this particular piece, they said that we had about 80% engagement. 
And I thought that was not too bad. And the other 20%, they went into a coma, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> when they came yeah. out, they were the last. If you, if you check your local universities, um, typically the grad students, the grad program, if they have, um, and I'm saying this because our local university has an instructional design um, instructional design or instructional technology studio or lab, and they have a usability studio in there. It doesn't do heat mapping. It just does um, various other tests on, you know, the number of clicks, and uh, it, it tracks your body language, and you, there's several cameras. Um, but it's, it's there for our use um, as a university. Of course, the students are getting uh, training, and they're getting their grade by using it. And then it, they usually just rent it out for a very nominal fee as to what a true usability company would cost to go do. Uh, but it gives you a quick um, sort of temperature of your your course, and um, it, I've used it a couple times. It works really good. I think. Um, hang on. I think I know. I saw another question in here. I want to grab. I think actually, Terrence is back from vacation too. So. I think <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know what happened there. I think uh, actually, I thought it was uh, on your end, Rick, because I wasn't getting a feed from anything. But turns out my uh, my internet just went down, so I wasn't getting anything. Yeah, that's what I'll, I'll fix my camera here in a second don't too. Don't believe him. He goes to Hawaii <laughs> real quickly. He's got a spare. <laughs> Well, I was taking over your job, Terrence, and I was sort of fielding questions from the chat. Uh, uh, Don asked, do you test designs with learners? Yes, I do. Not as often as I'd like to, just because of the availability uh, to those end users. And here's something that we, we try to do. Uh, and again, we don't do it as often as, as I would like to do. Um, but anytime you push out something that's new, if you're going in a different direction, grab what, what we call a new learner. And a new learner is anybody in your organization that's been there less than 90 days. And then a recent learner, and that would be somebody from 90 days to about a year. And I say that because the new learner is the extreme exact opposite of the SME that's working on the project. So you'll get both ends. You'll get the SME pushing the content, and you'll get the learner like, oh, my gosh, I'm overwhelmed. Why do I need all this content? Mm -hmm. And they'll tell you. And then hopefully you come to the middle. The recent learner, um, 90 days to a year, um, they've, they're they not new. They're not new people in your organization, but they've been around long enough. They kind of get it. They've, they're, they're kind of embedded in the culture by now. They kind of understand all the rules and policies and all that. So they might have some really new, fresh outlook and fresh ideas and perspective because they've not sort of gotten into that. If you grab somebody that's been in a company 10 years, um, and, and I'll be the first one to admit, we, we tend to develop filters over time. Um, and we quickly say no about certain things. And then it's really great to have, and I invite all the fresh perspective that we can get to help me look in a different direction. I think that's called compliance training. Yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> right. Yeah, I've got a filter for compliance. Well, Terrence, how was the vacation? The vacation was great. Was you know, I, I got to go up to uh, to the closet upstairs to reset my modem. So it was quite quite the trip. Very pleasant. Uh, Time Warner strikes again, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, I do have Time Warner, but I, I'd venture to say every everybody suffers from you know that same problem. Not not just us Time Warner uh, no, customers. It's it, been pretty good. I can't complain too much. Ever since we went to the Time Warner Turbo, it's been really reliable. Time Warner Turbo. Turbo. That's where they charge you more to be a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> you pay a premium just for the name. Yeah. Well, I, I, we're, in a, we're in a horrible state where we are. We're, I'm two blocks away from Fios at home and two blocks away from Fios at work. So it's like, it's frustrating. <laughs> So I, I know I missed a, a lot here probably in that in that seven minute time frame. Uh, you know, we were just grabbing them. questions out of the chat room and I'm kind of feeling just kind of feeling them as as we can. Okay. Kevin you know, uh, Rick and I have uh, we, in the projects we work together on one of the things that we come across that um, can get frustrating from the instructional design perspective is the use of humor. And I know the last couple of projects I've worked on with Rick, I've, um, you know, I have a tendency to lean towards the humor side as much as I can, but oftentimes I find that the client really can't interpret that. Right. And a lot of times they're like, oh, we, we can't put that, our, company, our organization won't understand it or it might just push it over the edge. <laughs> I know, we get that. That's, that's, that's my right. thought process is all the booze. And I think humor um, is great, but unfortunately in a lot of places it's just – and I think part of it is deep pockets, lawyers, everybody's afraid of, oh, my gosh, we may hurt somebody's feelings. 
Yeah, it's 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 it subjective. Um, yeah. You kind of you kind of take it with a grain of salt, mm-hmm. and um, I always start with humor. I always start out with you know engaging. I start with fun. You know, I don't like yeah. boring e-learning more than Lex person does. Mm-hmm. So um, if you build something and you think it's boring, put it in some. You don't have to do a usability study. Just put it in somebody that's not going to take the training. You know, maybe a coworker that sits on a different floor or. Uh, maybe it's a friend of yours that works in a different company across the street that you meet for lunch. Just say, hey, I want to show you something. What do you think? Take your laptop, go to Starbucks, yeah. pull it up, and get their reaction. And a lot of times, you know, you, you, can't, you can't get everything you want in it and at the same time trying to get everything the SME wants in there and satisfy, yeah. you know, to your point, uh, HR and legal and, and all the other things that are going on in a corporation. That's so, hey, you know, Terrence, we haven't tried the monkey, though. We that have it. Just try a monkey. Just throw a monkey in there and see what they say. <laughs> that could that could be our narrator on the the one the project we are working on right now. Google it. I was told that it's it's true. There's facts out there. There's a lot of research, and yeah. uh, it's it's a truth. You put a monkey in e-learning, you will be engaged. <laughs> <laughs> But, and, and I guess my, my question was even broader than just the, the humor side is, how do you sell your e-learning to the client, internal or external, when they aren't as creative or aren't as inspired as, as you are? Um, they, don't, they don't have a choice. <laughs> no, mm-hmm. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> it, fortunately, I've not had really run into a problem where we're trying to sell a design um, because we really take a methodical step. Um, first off, we don't design visually anything. Um, we stay out of the tool until we get the instructional content figured out from, mm-hmm. from an instructional flow, whether that be scenario, branching, you know, storytelling, depending on the, on the style. Um, at, that, at, at that phase of the project, if we're going to tell a story, then we can get a little more creative because now the SME's on board with telling a story, and then we can sell the idea, a concept of a story is you need certain assets to, to convey that story mm-hmm. um, depending on you know it really depends on the front end and then once you get to the front end then you move into what um, you know your storyboarding and your prototyping phase mm-hmm. and that's really when you start getting the visuals out so you, you're really doing it now your second phase is really an instructional visual design you're still not building anything yet so now you've taken the SME's content from the from the instructional side and you're storyboarding it and then you get into a visual prototype and say okay here's what your content's going to look like visually and then we play with that until we get it we get the right UI down we get the right colors down we get the right graphics if we're if we're using uh, uh, photos or photo themes you know we have to go through all the uh, all the photos to make sure they're the right photos and they're approved and, and we can use them if they're um, if, if, if it's more of a cartoony thing or comic related then we have to go through to make sure all of that's consistent um, and, and then we go into actual development and building a course by the time we get there there's no selling done it's all done on the front end but I think it's important and I, and I give SMEs a hard time but I think it's really important to um, teach the SMEs what we do I, I really think a lot of times um, those folks are just as busy and they've got just as much going on balancing several projects not to mention, you know, they, they just get assigned, you're a subject matter ex- expert for this project, you know, go build with the training department. Uh, they don't have any idea no more than what we want them to do. So I think a lot of our responsibility is to actually teach and train those SMEs on what that process is and be true consultants to them and teach them and let them know and earn their trust and saying, hey, I'm good at what I do. Let me show you. I know you're good at what you do. So let's work together and we'll get through this. And I know that's that's the happy medium or the the fluffy definition of it but uh, I, I think, uh, we I, found a lot of success in the last we kind of changed our approach with SMEs in the last year and I think we've we've gotten a lot better at it. Now getting back to, to Terrence's comment on humor one of the problems with humor is that it doesn't translate well always across an organization and, right. and also the bigger the organization the deeper the pockets the more afraid of lawsuits and so they, they just tend to back away from the whole concept of humor in terms of, oh, my gosh, what if it offends somebody? And yeah, so, they, so it becomes political correctness, which is usually pretty useless. But that is the, the nature of big companies and big organizations. Right, yes. They run afraid of just about everything. So as right. a result, training tends to be this side of horrifically boring. Right. And you have to, and, and you have to let go. 
Um, if yeah, that's, that's the case, mm -hmm. you just have to let go and move on Throw them and hope in. the next project is, is well, they'll let go. Yep. Yeah. Well, we have three questions here in the, um, in the chat room, so I'll see how, how much we can get to here because I know we only have about five more minutes. But okay. uh, Kelly from Open Sesame is asking, uh -oh. asking, how do you persuade the course? Uh, you lost. You're you know, broken, you breaking up on me, Terrence. Up. Okay. Well, it's, it's the third question in the chat room there. It's how do you persuade the subject matter expert to cut the fat when designing your course? <laughs> I don't persuade him. I just tell him I'm taking this out. <laughs> that actually works. No, no it, and that's and it goes back to that relationship. If you really truly build that relationship with your SME um, and try to earn that trust, they're they're trusting you to come up with uh, an end solution for their project, which ultimately mm -hmm. they're going to, um, you know, they're going to be held accountable at, in the end because they're the project manager uh, essentially. Um, so when we get um, uh, oftentimes what I like to do is just give me everything you got. I don't care what it is. Every piece of information material you've got on this. And then we set up a time and we go and we go hash through it and we start, and again, we go back to the basics. What's the relevance to the learner? What is it that they really need to know? And how much of that is going to affect their performance outcome at the other end? What do you want that learner to do when they hit the next or the, the complete button or they close that window? What do you want them to do when they walk away from this? And we start there and say, well, I want them to be able to do this, this. is okay, then is this piece of content relevant to that end goal? No. Mm -hmm. Is this piece of content? No. Is it, well, yeah, that's good. Let's use that. So we, yeah. then we sift through it all. And that's really uh, to Kelly's question. Just That's how you cut the fat. Okay. Um, get away from your authoring tools. Get away from your graphics. Quit picking photos out before you've designed your e-learning. Go, go sit with the SME and work through it. And uh, then the rest of it really is kind of easy after that if you do all the – and it's all – it's hard work. Eighty percent of that's really on the front end. We get all that hashed out. The development side is not as hard. Okay. And our next question comes from Zara King, and she's asking, how do you explain the concept before the visual design? Uh, which is going back to, I guess, your statements right before we got into the uh, discussion about the SME. Yeah, I'm seeing that. How do you explain the concept before the visual design? Um, you play charades and you act it out. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Finger puppets. Um, <laughs> you know, you, you, you take a pad of graph paper and a pencil or you take a whiteboard and a dry erase marker and you start visualizing your mind map. Uh, and that's the word I'm looking for. You just kind of mind map through, and you kind of you you, you kind of work through that concept visually, and you start mind mapping out those ideas. And then from there, you you start building your you go in there. Then you go into your prototype. Because a prototype, yeah, I, really, if you think about it, that's your model, um, that's your framework. Because once a prototype gets approved, there's just uh, just a, there should be just a minor few tweaks and in some of the design of the UI, and then it's just a matter of inserting and, and developing the content to go in it. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of work that leads up to, you know, that prototype phase and storyboarding. That's right, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> and our, our last question is from uh, Justin, and he's asking, is e-learning becoming a harder sell internally due to the momentum around social or collaborative learning? No, I don't think so. I don't think, I don't think every, I think actually if you look at it, a lot of orgs are still not on the social media bandwagon. And it's not because they don't want to, it's because, and there's a lot of reasons. I mean, it goes back to the yeah. HR legal aspects. Um, um, some of the people writing those policies or um, they're just, they're just not there yet. And whether they ever get there, that's not up to us. We just, we just keep showing them what's available. How can we be more effective at what we're trying to do with e-learning? Um, and how learning truly happens socially, we all know that. Um, but a lot of orgs haven't even adopted social media as part of their training yet, so trying, it, we can't push it on them because we're not going to change their mind. Um, well, I would say social media in terms of maybe um, uh, modern definitions of it, but hey, the, the LMSs do have social media aspects to them. So yeah, ours, of ours does too, but we don't have it turned on. We've got it turned off only because mm -hmm. of the policies today about yeah. social media and we're getting there. Um, uh, there's, there's open conversation. There's, there's a lot of interest, but we, mm -hmm. we're a really big organization. So we're being really careful as to how to employ this 
correctly. Sure. And also um, the, the rules of, of etiquette, conduct, and, and mm -hmm. discretion in social media are nowhere near being at the corporate level. No, no. And that's the same with mobile. There's, there's just, um, you know, that goes back to the shiny object where a company goes out and buys a bunch of iPads and they want to put e-learning on iPads. But where's the business value? What is it, what is it you're wanting to do with these iPads exactly. and who's going to use them? Um, in our company, we're, we're exploring uh, mobile uh, technology and, and the use of mobile for learning. Um, but we're certainly not going to go out and, and, and purchase a bunch of devices and re restructure our entire network in order to support mobile technology when we don't even have an idea how we're going to use it yet, if that makes sense. So um, mm -hmm. my encouraging words on all that is just keep your finger on the pulse, get embedded, and, and learn as much as you can how mobile and social, social learning um, is part of our industry when it comes to e-learning. And just be ready for it. When your company says, hey, we want to test this, be the first one in line to say, hey, I've got some ideas I think we can, we can try because I've been testing these ideas or whatever. Sure. And the two work collaboratively, too. I don't think that it's an either-or situation. No. Um, no, you know, I think that the truly exceptional learning solutions um, will take bits and pieces of so many different uh, tools that you know, we can't just narrow it down to one. Exactly. So it sounds like we're getting our closing music so from Rick. Closing music. Is it's that our time. elevator music? It's our yes. elevator music time for us to call it another show. Well, <laughs> well anything before? I know we didn't have a chance to ask you this earlier, so let's ask it now, Rick. Um, yeah. but do you have anything to promote, Kevin, before we uh, we let you go? No, just follow the nugget head, you know. I'm for hire, actually. Okay, great. Great. And yeah, everybody can see your next project at the DevLearn. Uh, uh, yeah, up in so bring November. it, parents. That's right. They can see see Kevin lose uh, yeah. for the next Articulate Guru. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah. going to go to have fun, and I'm going to bring everything I got to it. So if somebody else has got something out there that can come toe to toe, bring it. I'm, I encourage it. I'll give it away. <laughs> it's yours, Terrence, for the taking. <laughs> All right. Well, on, on that note, I guess we'll uh, we'll close out to, yep, today. Next week, we've got Kristen Rourke from Rourke Training. She's going to talk all about different aspects of training, especially in the instructor led arena. Fantastic. Well, Kevin, well, thanks, everybody. A, a pleasure having you here. Thanks, everybody in the chat room. Thanks, everybody. Uh, and everybody watching uh, later on. Everybody have a good week. You too. Take care, everybody. <laughs>